and welcome back to the Europe Preliminaries. My name is Frodan, and it's time for our final match to determine who will be the eighth player joining us for the Winter Championships in March. I am joined on the desk by Brian Kibler as well as D2. Uh, you did a great job hosting, man. How did it feel? to finally be in this seat and switching around the roles. <laughs> to be honest, a bit nerve wracking, <laughs> you know, a bit of a different role yeah. for me, but obviously talking in my ear the entire time. But uh, <laughs> it felt good, though. It was pretty fun. It was. You're doing a great job. And uh, Brian, how have you been enjoying the event? We're almost done. Can you believe it? Yeah, I mean, it's it's been a lot of fun. It's uh, it's been, you know, it's felt like a longer event than it actually has been because it's been some early mornings for us here. But uh, it's been great to see all these players uh, coming through and sort of the storylines creating themselves uh, leading into the Europe Championship next month. Yeah, the story thus far as we've been mentioning all weekend long is that it's been the mark of the dark horses. They've been coming in through in waves. We have seven players so far. We have Dr. Hippie, uh, Pakravach, Nick Slay, Diggin, Sariza, Tars, Nyman, and finally one more player between ROL or Rawl and Bonnie Hopper, a player that we've seen on stream earlier today. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to see who's going to be able to go all the way here because there's only one spot left. Even though both these players are guaranteed $2,500, the real prize is being able to come here for the championship. I mean, uh, I'm sure both these players, you know, they've, got, they've come this far. While they won't be too disappointed to go home with uh, with a good chunk of change for their troubles, uh, they, their goal really is to move on to the championship next month. Yeah, obviously, like you said, they have a lot of prize money getting to this point, $2,500. But every time you win, you get more and more, and you get more of that uh, time on screen. So definitely both these players highly, motiv to, highly motivated excuse me, to move on. Taking a look at their lineups, going to be the Warrior, Druid, Paladin, and Warlock for Bunny Hopper, and Druid, Paladin, Warrior, and Warlock for Rawl. The Warrior of Bunny Hopper was banned, and the Warlock of Rawl was banned. Kipler, what do you think about those bans there? Uh, it's interesting. I, th I think that you know we've we've seen uh, we've actually seen Bunny Hopper uh, play already, and if if I recall correctly, I believe he was the practice partner of uh, Diggin, mm -hmm. who uh, brought that uh, very aggressive style of uh, of Paladin deck. So I think that, that he may be looking to uh, to you know lean on that in, 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 to give him a bit of an edge in this matchup. Yeah, it'd be really interesting to see if these guys actually prepare the same decks with each other. Um, when you look at other teams or even just practice partners, a lot of times they bounce ideas that help improve their lineups in general. So one of the examples I love to pull is G2. Uh, Tyson Life Coach have very similar play styles and therefore when they start collaborating with each other their Warlock decks look similar, their Druid decks look similar, maybe one or two card difference. I, I, I'd be really excited to see once again maybe because that, that Paladin deck uh, it got to that round for a reason, yep. right? When, when we see these, these really cool strategies come together maybe it's opportunity for them to see really different strategies come uh, actually work here. The difference of course on ROL's side is that he is playing Warrior instead of the Warlock because that's the difference in ban here and that's also been one of the X factors because people feel like Paladin's not really worth banning. It's, it's decks like the Warrior. Uh, why do you think people are ignoring Paladin so much despite the fact that people are you know sick of playing it so often? You know, Can you talk about that, Kibler? I think a lot of people have constructed their lineups in such a way that they hope to beat Secret Paladin. You know, we're seeing a lot of decks like Freeze Mage uh, that are aimed at uh, combating that particular matchup so people are looking to you know not not necessarily ban it out but target their lineup toward beating it well, right. Another thing to keep in mind is that, I mean, we've seen Paladin be one of the most banned classes and the highest win rate class. And we kind of mentioned this earlier, but for instance, like Warrior, it's highly banned, but has a low win rate. So people who actually don't ban it have a pretty good plan, it seems like, against it. Whereas Paladin just wins anyway, so just let it play. <laughs> well, we've, we've seen, we've seen War Warlock, or rather Warrior, get banned quite a bit. And I think a lot of that has to do with just how popular we have seen Freeze Mage. Right, right, right. Uh, you know, if, you, if you are playing a lineup that has Freeze Mage, in general, you're not going to want to run into to a warrior with it, regardless <laughs> of whether it is uh, control or patron. Though we did see uh, a, a number of, uh, of uh, Freeze Mage decks overcome warrior over the weekend. Certainly. Now let's take a look at the opening hands. Aro chooses to keep a secret along with the Mustaford battle, and he picks up yet another one. That's not what we're looking for. And ah, it's just the icing on top. He threw away Cockhammer and got it back anyways. <laughs> Uh, that's one of the, you know, a really hard things about Secret Paladin. You're very dependent on your curve, and everyone always talks about how powerful it is. But if you don't get it, you can get completely overwhelmed by a deck that builds the board very fast, like Zoo. Yeah, and not only that, but uh, you know, the, there is a cost to the Serious Challenger. It's a very powerful card, but uh, in the games where you, you draw the secrets and not the Challenger, well, those cards aren't that powerful, and we're seeing exactly that right here. 
Yeah, That's exactly. Right. One thing that Roll kind of has in his favor, if he was potentially watching Bunny Hopper play before, he might know that this is Zeus, so obviously he wants a fast start, so keeping that event along with him must for battle, which will almost guarantee getting something as long as, you know, he Bunny Hopper doesn't have, isn't able to just ignore it. Yeah, Muster and Avenge, the combination of the two of them is, is quite powerful against uh, against Zoo. You're able to uh, both sort of generate a, a, a weapon that's, that's actually quite relevant in the matchup because there's lots of small minions as well as uh, significant board threat. But RL is pretty far behind already. Yeah, three dudes against a 2-2, two -two, a 2-2, two -two, and a 4-2. Well, now there's three dudes and three dudes. But <laughs> <laughs> and you, you don't necessarily want to be face tanking this just to uh, just to get uh, one health off of it. And and here, ooh, that wow. knife juggler, that, right could be, that could be pretty big. <laughs> right on time here is that knife juggler and can just play out that flame, flame imp as well. And Bunny Hopper is a, I mean, I think he knows it's a vent at this point. Mm -hmm. So he's a, doesn't really want to set this off, but I mean, you can't ignore ooh, forever. Well, and now we just can ignore it actually. Well, but, if this is, if this is a uh, event, he may just want to to clear things to protect the juggler. Deal with it because now. Because if he if he actually trades right. in uh, his his uh, flame imp here with the juggler or with rather the, the avenged minion, now he has juggler on board with implosion in hand, going to four mana next turn. Absolutely. And another thing to keep in mind was that consecration would have been a disaster mm -hmm. there. So even though there's usually only one fight in Secret Paladin, sometimes if it just basically loses the game. Uh, you want to deal with that right away. But Keeper of Voldemort is another thing to keep in mind for Bunny Hopper there. The fact that, you know, you can't really buff minions if there's nothing on the board. Wow. ROL um, or Roll? I, I think we're just going to flip flop between that name. <laughs> you know, I'm not exactly sure, but, uh, you know, he's choosing to go for this and leaving the knife juggler up, which I always feel like is super dangerous That's on four mana. It's so scary. And here, uh, Bunny Hopper, he can, yeah, I, I was going to say, I think he's going to attack into that and then implosion in one of these minions, which will, and we see a little roll of the eyes from uh, RL there. Oh, okay. Only, only two. There's so All many right. two rolls on the implosion today. It's been. absolutely insane. And it's going to hit the face because otherwise Roll can clear that off with his face as well. So might as well get the free damage in. And while, while that was a pretty risky play from Roll, he wasn't punished as badly as he might have been because he, uh, he does have now the Cog Hammer on this with 1-1. One, one, which will be able to clear the imp, and then he can actually use the cog hammer to kill the knife juggler as well. Yeah, and I mean, because the one ones don't stick around, there's not enough trading while still pushing out damage. There's just a huge difference between clearing the board, having three or four imps versus not. So, you know, Bunny Hopper not really getting the, the knife juggles that he wants. He's gonna end up life tapping instead. Picks up a pretty excellent card. Dark Peddler has a lot of versatility. Ooh. So a lot of damage options here. He has a total of nine damage in hand right now with those abusive sergeants and the Doom card. So I think it's going to be either Power Overwhelming or Soulfire here. Probably Power. Though he, the Void Walker is kind of appealing too against, uh, it protects potentially his minions right. from that, that Cog Hammer. And uh, it's, it's, it's definitely a, a difficult decision, I think, for Bunny Hopper here. Come on, Kibler, let's just go face here. Oh, oh look, he takes the, he takes the Void Walker. I always lose this. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but I imagine this, this imp is going to go face, though. Is he really going to trade? Oh, my, your opponent's in 14. It is the turn before a mysterious is. challenge. That yeah. is true. That is true. That's a very and, important and point. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is because when mysterious challenger pulls all those secrets, assuming he pulls the normal five Christmas tree, the Christmas tree lights, uh, you know, it, it, you, the more you have on your board, the stronger the mysterious challenger impact has. Competitive spirit buffs more, mm -hmm. Avenge has more targets. Uh, so you just want to keep the board clear. And ultimately, mm. you know, Zoo still has this game plan. It's not trying to rush because it's not going to draw a kill command. It's not going to draw a lava burst off the top. It's just going to draw more minions. So right. you want to continue to have board control so that way you can emphasize those win conditions for your victory. Yeah, and, and uh, Bunny, Ho uh, Bunny Hopper it does have you know a reasonable amount of, of damage in his hand, but that damage is all minion based. And if Rol is able to establish a strong board presence, that becomes much more difficult for him to actually get that damage in. Yeah, absolutely. So with that in mind, what does Roll do here on this turn? Do you just throw up that Sludge Belcher and cross your fingers and hopes it stays up? There's no real synergy between the Sludge Belcher and the rest of his secrets, so. I mean, you, you could play a vent here just to set up for future turns, but obviously not going to get anything done. Maybe it kind of puts the fear in your opponent that this could be potentially a redemption. Redemption is something what you're is, scared of here. Is there no interaction where if you play the Sludge Belcher first and then the secret, the Sludge Belcher spawns the slime, therefore you actually buff the slime I when it dies? I think that might be how it works. I, because I, I remember there was a, a sequence back 
with a f few other death rattles like that, like Harvest Golem when Avenge first came out, and, and that was definitely the one. The attack by, uh, by uh, ROL here may suggest as well that this is actually Noble Sacrifice. Right. Because, you know, that attack, getting getting the Void Caller down to one, it's kind of suspect. You're like, okay, well, why would you do that? And uh, doesn't look like Bunny Hopper is falling for Oh, it, he's though. not? Wow. He's no in. fear. Just goes straight in there. Oh, and it, I believe it's something else dies. That's how it works. <laughs> okay. And I have no idea well, how the I mean, rules I, work. And we attack for two. It, it, it is <laughs> one of those <laughs> interesting nuances where that's you have to be really careful with how you sequence things. Because it could be the difference yeah. between it triggering or not. Mm -hmm. So it was something that... I, I was just curious about. I, yeah, I believe I believe it is. If if for instance there were a flame strike and another minion died at the same time as a sludge belcher, then the timing. I would, believe would the timing does work that way. Right. Oh, okay, very interesting. So unfortunately, Rawl by opening up the board here, he's That's given his opponent the opportunity to play Doom Guard. Otherwise, there's only ten damage on board. And although obviously you can't just leave up a board to bring yourself to one. That's kind of sketchy, right? Or there, he but. wouldn't be able to play any minions too because you just have to attack that is, a that minion into it. So he, he's he's not really in a position where he can play around it in any means and. There, the Doom Guard is going to. Yep. Uh, well, I imagine. Oh, okay. He knows there's no. Uh, Noble Sacrifice. No, doesn't really matter. And no eye for an eye. <laughs> play, played around both of them. He's testing. Wait, wait, wait. Is he testing for Sacred Trial here? Uh, yeah, I guess. You might so. as well, right? You have lethal be. anywhere. You might as well because you have lethal anywhere. Careful. Yeah, no, this is, this is the. Uh, <laughs> that, that's actually pretty heads up. I mean, like, that's. <laughs> Very few people will be like, okay, what could I lose to here? And think of Sacred Trial. <laughs> so that's 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 an interesting, uh, you know, definitely an interesting uh, uh, you know, line of play for Bunny Hopper. Yeah. There, there wasn't any downside to it, but it's it's really not something a lot of people would notice. I, I didn't even think about it, it's frankly, until you, until you mentioned Sacred Trial as a possibility. I do what I can, Kibler. <laughs> because the Paladin would have been on eight mana hitting the Tyria, yeah. and then all of a sudden you're locked out without a silence of some sort, and Paladin could climb back from that position. Yeah, so the uh, <laughs> One of those like 2% cases, 1% even lower, uh, end up being a really good technical play. So, yeah. you know, heads up from Bunny Hopper and making sure that he's just playing, you know, completely well at this point, you know, covering all of his bases. Mm -hmm. I like it. For sure. Exactly. And he took a lot of heat before when I casted him. He basically went with a play where he went with coin into Wild Growth instead of Wrath. Got a lot of heat on Twitter for that, so maybe he's trying to just prove himself here in this game. <laughs> Vindicate himself. I, I I can say, and I know you guys also have much experience with this too, is that when you're in that seat, you tend to overthink a lot. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, now I'm on the stage. Let's think about all these plays. Um, but in this case, thinking about all that play was a very good move. So now that the Warlock deck is out of the way, and, and a very good one, a very good deck to get out of the way too, considering that there's Warriors still around, uh, you know, Bunny Hopper, I'm really liking his chances here. He's got two of the most powerful decks, if not the two best, uh, to move on from this series. And we have seen, uh, again, the, the, the aggro Paladin deck from Bunny Hopper. He's not playing Secret Paladin. He's playing the, the very aggressive the slanted. Type, yeah, yeah he, he had the uh, the uh, multiple abusive sergeants. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I believe if he's playing a similar deck to that that Diggin played, uh, that he, he was playing Lepronome as well. Right, yeah, I, I did see Lepronome in there. It's very similar to something like a normal Secret Paladin. Obviously, Lepronome is a bit different, but he does have those things like Divine Favor, which sometimes you're not able to get off if you have, you know, the bigger creatures like Tyrion and Rag and stuff like that. But it will be Warrior versus Druid for this game. Ah, the Control Warrior. You know, I was under the impression it was Patron just because we've seen a lot. However, we have seen a handful of Control Warriors as well. We've seen a fairly even split, I think, at least on uh, on camera at this point, I believe. And, and uh, We talked about this last game. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're talking about how Darnassus, when you have Darnassus in Living Roots, it can be pretty weak against something like Control Warrior because there's that's you know, one more minion that can just be taken out by a weapon, and then from there you don't have as much power, mm -hmm. just a car comes down, and you're not in combo range. Yeah, and uh, though I, I think that Aspirant is probably better than Living Roots against Warrior, because Living Roots, as an early threat, can often be punished by things like Armorsmith or Acolyte, right. whereas Darnassus Aspirant is actually a, a minion that kind of demands an answer from your opponent if they don't have the War Axe. Being able to accelerate into something like Shredder uh, can really put on a lot of pressure. Yeah, it's a fantastic point. When I, when you look at Darnassus Aspirin, you think, how could you not want that? It's a it's a mana ramp thing. But one thing that you know DT pointed out that was extremely astute is that Warrior doesn't really have too much value of cards like Fiery War Axe against Druid. There's, most of their minions are very hard for War Axe to trade effectively into, like the Pilot Shredder 
or drew the claw. It's like, are you willing to take that yeah. much damage <laughs> yeah, to you, actually trade it? You can't it? kill it, but uh, it's one yeah. for one, and you're taking a ton of damage. Well, during what we may, may, may call Patron Summer, you know, when when Patron you know, Warrior was pretty much the, the you know was pretty much the, the the deck that everyone played. Mm -hmm. uh, there was you know debate as to do you want one war axe, do you want two war axes, and it was actually uh, Darnass's Aspirant that typically led people to the decision of oh, I want two war axes because now it's actually good against Druid when for a long time it was a fairly weak card in Druid matchups. Uh, but here, Bunny Hopper has a hand of Aspirant into Shredder, uh, or even just in, uh, uh, innervating out this Shredder as well. And uh, that's a powerful hand against no War Axe on the opposing side. Right, I do like him going for the Aspirant first, however, because if he goes for the Innervate into Shredder, he has nothing else to play but the Aspirant next turn. And if there's no War Axe, then this is a bit better as well. Yeah, I, I agree, and there's there's a number of, uh, of things that uh, uh, Bunny Hopper could draw into that he would like to use Innervate for later. You know, being able to Innervate out a uh, you know Ancient of Lore, for instance, can allow him to piece together more uh, more things that he would uh, continue to be able to put threat in board. Or super long term, maybe double combo. What? Yeah, there's <laughs> it, it is it is interesting because you know, Innervate's a card that you know obviously is more powerful early in the game, but it still does have utility if you're able to piece together the right cards late. It's something that you have to be aware of because right now armor smith still is not indicative of if it's patron or mm -hmm. control warrior mm. but i you're completely right sometimes as a druid player you say i don't want to use this interview i want to keep it for the inevitable opportunity to use force or nature and two saboteurs with the double combo or even just force roar early in the game that's true that's also on turn seven or even turn six if you have two interviews or something like that uh, i know firebat for example 2014 world champion he actually just does not play Innervate sometimes and just draws until he has Emperor Thorson. It's almost like he's playing Freeze Mage in a way, where he's like, <laughs> I'm just going to hit every single combo piece and just kill Warriors. That's how that's how he played a lot of these matchups. Uh, and he had a very successful run on ladder doing this, even as early as last week or two weeks ago. So uh, I, I kind of like that strategy sometimes. If you can really dial in and know that it's Control Warrior, just play the, the game of attrition. You have a lot of value minions that are hard for Warrior to efficiently remove. No. And at that point, you can just go for the 22 plus damage. Speaking of Firebat, he's one of the people who kind of innovated taking Darnassus out and just mm -hmm. saying, you know what, it's not doing too well against Control. I want to just take this guy out and uh, help it out a bit. Obviously, the meta kind of swings back and forth where you need it against aggro in certain situations. It's true. Yeah, it was sacrilege. <laughs> you, you, I want mana, me want Mana crystal. That's like what Druid says, right? When is it? Whenever Malfurion sleep talking, that's what he's saying. <laughs> the greetings. Oh, wait. I want mana. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of what Malfurion's favorite card is—the mana addict. Uh, two mana card that kind of powers up back in the day. But uh, I mean, if you were if you were to kind of role play a little bit like that, I, I really like the the equip of the weapon here. Take out the down mm -hmm. aspirin. Druid has so many five drops. It's one of the most core cards to Druid. Not just because you also ramp very early on, but as the late stages of the game, Druid wants to be able to drop those double five drops. Uh, so you have so many of them in your deck. Azure Drakes, Druid of the Claw, Harrison Jones, even sometimes a Sludge Belcher. And here I think we see kind of exactly that being uh, the, the guiding source of, of Bunny's uh, uh, play here. He chooses to use the Innervate, only effectively getting one mana to set up that, that Azure Drake, which is just going to die to Death Spite, but it does allow him to advance his board in a meaningful way. Mm -hmm. And there are, as you said, so many five drops in the deck he may be able to draw into with the Battle Cry of Azure Drake. So if you're roll here, do you use that Execute right away and risk it being a taunt so that you can't kill that <laughs> Azure Drake? Or do you just kind of, you know, bite the bullet and kill it anyway, not really kill that Shredder. I imagine we're, we're going to see this Accolade of Pain come down with it, but kind of tough here. What are the odds of a taunt coming out, Dude, Do you know? I thought, like, you don't have to say exact percentages, but like how many taunt minions are there, do you think? It's about 50-50, either, <laughs> either it happens or it doesn't. <laughs> Thanks, Amaz. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we can count it, I suppose. There's the Druid uh, Robo Cub, there's the... Um, do, you, do you know how many minions there are? I think it's How like two five? drop minions. No, no, I'm saying just total two drop minions. It's like over 80, right? Well, over 80. That, there's there's a lot of numbers that are over 80. Yeah, but like around <laughs> between 80 and 90, I think. <laughs> yeah. Well, I remember before League of Explorers and TGT it was around 72 around that. So, right. Uh, nowadays, you're right. Like it's just it's kind of a lower percentage. You don't really play around that. It's kind of like playing around Doomsayer and Unstable Ghoul and Explosive Sheep. Right. Those are like the problematic two drops that can completely swing boards, but it's very rare, so you don't really play that. Yeah, and here we're seeing Bunny Hopper, as we were mentioning earlier, uh, having some of those cards that just don't match up well against Control Warrior. He has Living Roots in his hand, which is just not a big threat. He has a number of powerful late-game cards with his Savage Roars, but really nothing he wants to play this turn. 
But what, what do you think there's an opportunity for him to potentially set up for a double Savage Roar? I mean, sometimes when when life gives you lemons or Savage Roars, you should just go ahead and use them. <laughs> and go to the face. That's right? how the saying goes, right? <laughs> when life gives you Savage Roars, go to the face. I think that's what it says, actually. That's, that's like, that's like uh, the art of war, Sun Tzu. <laughs> It's an well, ancient proverb. there is a bit of value to buffing up your Bone Guard Lieutenant right now, so it gets out of the range of the mm -hmm. cool Taskmaster in hand. Obviously, that's not something you totally expect all the time. Sure. But it is something, so. So if he has two Savage Drawers, and let's say these Living Roots were able to uh, live on, he would have 21 damage next turn just with the two Savage Drawers. That's absurd. That's now, a lot of roars. They're not gonna, they're not gonna survive or he's not gonna be able to get all that damage through depending on what role chooses, but I really like that kind of setup. Like, you know, I have to use the cards in my hand to win instead of waiting for the normal circumstance of Force of Nature before I can use the Savage Roar. Yeah, so now uh, the, the Bone Guard Lieutenant, thanks to the Inspire, was able to live through killing the Acolyte. And Rawl has, has a couple options here. You know, he can just play Cruel Taskmaster. He could just drop a Sludge Belcher. Uh, Bunny Hopper does have the damage on board to take out the front half of Sludge Belcher. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's not necessarily as appealing as it might be. Right, it feels kind of bad, right? Either you go for a very weak play and going for that cool task, or you go for the Sludge Belcher, which just dies. Looks like he's going to do neither and go with it uh, the Death Bite here. And that will set up for future turns, but he's taking a lot of damage in the meantime. This does set up to possibly kill, say, an Emperor Thoris in this turn. He'd be able to use the Death Spite with the Death Rattle. Not only you know, only kill the possible Emperor or, say, Sylvanas, you know, the, the various six drops that uh, Druid tends to play. Also clear off these uh, these little saplings as well. I can also kill the Druid of the Claw after, with using that uh, Cruel Taskmaster afterwards. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. So your Bunny Hopper here, do you go with the Taunt and hope your opponent doesn't have one extra damage, or do you just go all phase here? And I'm, I'm wondering if you want to use Savage Roar now. That, that it it depends true. on what you what you evaluate your hand to be. Because if you do it, that's 14 damage, and you put your opponent to five, and you have some more follow up damage. However, if your opponent has, you know, the ever elusive Shield Maiden follow up, <laughs> it's going to be a little bit more difficult. But you know, personally, I I like being aggressive. You're up He's reaching for a, it. It's floating <laughs> over the board. There's a roar. Wow, double roar here, and look at Roll's face. I like he it. Is, All right. uh, he's a bit nervous right now. And damage coming down. Yeah, there's 14 damage. So Bunny Hopper puts Rawl down to just five life. And Rawl's got to feel a little bit nervous. <laughs> <laughs> so do you go for the Sludge Belcher here? Sludge Belcher, I mean, it's kind of like the combo stopper, but there's no Savage Roar anymore. You can potentially like attack your opponent's face to clear off those two minions and then play Shield Maiden. I think that probably feels maybe safer. It's probably better proactively because you expect like an Ancient of uh, Lore the following turn. You can Shield right, Slam right, it. Right. And then it becomes more complicated mana-wise. I'd rather play the mana efficient play and get proactive. Plus, you don't know if the Shield Maiden damage is relevant for hitting face. I mean, one of these scenarios where Warrior often gets to is like, you have to kill the Druid because the Druid's just going to refill their hand, keep pressuring, keep pressuring, and you're just going to crumble. So it is It is worth noting that now that Bunny Hopper has used both of his Savage Roars, his, his total damage threat from this point on is much lower. Force of Nature becomes just Force of Nature. It's just six damage from hand. And uh, that does allow uh, ROL to play this game from a different position. And you can see in Ro Roll's face as well, he's kind of looking up to the side, kind of doing calculations, right? Like, what are the damage possibilities? Obviously, like, the first thing that comes in your mind is, you know, 14, you know, 22, all those different Druid combos. But for Roll, he's like, wait, how much can my opponent do now? And, and again, we are, we're back to five. <laughs> the magic number seems to be five, but the magic number is in fact four from that swipe, and that's what, that's what Buddy Hopper is hoping he can get Rawl to to start his turn, so he's actually able to just finish the, the game off. If he draws his other swipe, though, uh, he's going to have eight mana next turn, and that would be lethal. That, that would, would be. be. So does he pick it up right here? Might be one of his last chances to do and so. Ooh, it's Drew to the claw, but that's can't get through a sludge belcher. Swipe I mean, kind of get can. through the hard way. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it, it can eventually, but not right now. And this swipe used, it does reduce the amount of burst damage that Bunny Hopper does have available to him as well. Right, I think Raw's going to continue to armor up every single time. Playing Sylvanas isn't that bad either. Obviously, mm -hmm. you want to get that Dr. Boom out, but uh, going with the Sylvan, basically armoring up every single time. I Druid doesn't really have that much damage without Savage Roar. Uh, it's still got a reasonable amount of damage, but you've seen Swipe, you've seen the Savage Roars. And it does limit a lot of its range. Wild Growth does not do very much damage. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes it draws a card and that card could do damage. That could, exactly. <laughs> not now, unfortunately. 
Uh, so, you know, Bunny Hopper just ho waiting and hoping for the best. He's looking for cards like Ancient of Lore to pull him back. And Roll, in the meantime, he's looking for cards like if he's playing Alex Straza, if he's playing Justicar True Heart. Um, you know, he, he also has an opportunity to steal an Emperor Thorson, uh, shield slamming his own Sylvanas. This is something that a lot of players often get tempted to do because it's very appealing to have Emperor Thorson on your side, but you have to remember that the longer Sylvana stays on the board, the it's actually a problem for Druid to also trade into things and, and how it plays big minions. So you know, there is a lot of value to also keeping Sylvanas. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And you want damage on your on your opponent as well. What do you think about using the Shield Slam on this Thorson? Obviously, he's going to do that right now, but... Oh, he's going to take it. Okay, he's going to actually take the Thorson. And I, I actually, suppose this is reasonable. I kind of like this because uh, Arwell or Rawl is in a position where he just needs to be able to, to react to things as quickly as possible. Right. His his total health is very, very low. Right. He, it's a very precarious position, and putting himself uh, with a redu uh, hand of reduced cost things allows him to react to the board much more efficiently uh, than he otherwise would be able to do. Mm -hmm. I was thinking of a kind of a weird play. You go for the Cruel Task on the Sylvanas and hit the face to get extra damage, and if it gets BGH, you take the BGH. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't mind that either. Uh, but in this case, I mean, Bunny Hopper is definitely struggling. And, and Ooh, without Elise. Ooh, Elise Star Seeker. His Brian awesome. Kibler's favorite card. It is. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I am very happy to see that go down right now. Kibler right. pleased. <laughs> well, you know, with I mean, Star Seeker not going to be entirely too relevant, I think, to the win condition. It's going to make me happy. <laughs> oh, good. And that's relevant. You know to what? me, it's Valentine's Day. Maybe not you. You, you might not to play it though. The game might be. <laughs> the game might end it before is, we I play it. I don't think we're gonna find the artifact. I'll just say that. <laughs> so I think the play here is you go for the cruel task, execute on that bear. You kill off this Drake either with your Shredder or your Thorison, and then you play the Doctor Boom, and you're threatening lethal. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. And you're a really high life total. I don't think Druid can do that much damage without Roar. Yeah, I mean, there's only been uh, one card remaining in Bunny's hand that is reduced. The roars are gone. So the burst potential that Bunny has uh, is, is really low. And yeah, I imagine we're just going to see everything removed from Bunny's side of the board. Some damage push the face and boom, come down. And that's really going to leave pretty much no outs for Bunny at this point. Except for Doomster, maybe. There could be. Uh, swipe with the BGH is also pretty good. Swipe BGH right. is, it's OK. And he could draw for it. It's true. In fact, he has multiple ways to draw for it. First, the wild growth. And then the Wrath still has man to play everything. And that is another Wrath. All right. <laughs> so now Doing he's it. fishing one more time for another <laughs> swipe. No, it's a shade next Ramus. That's not going to be helpful. And that should be it. Oh, no, he can go for one more Doomsayer attempt. All right, let's see if it is that Doomsayer here. Otherwise, he's dead. And it is. It is oh, a that was a Lance care, care, and that's it. So uh, ROL will be tying the series up one game to one. I think that game was all Elise. <laughs> 100%. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I definitely agree with that. Elise, just right when it came into his hand, he yeah, won the as game. As soon as he drew Elise, the game was over. Exactly. But just, kinda, it's just science. That kind of shows how <laughs> having Darnassus, I mean, even though it kind of sticks on the board for a second, it's just not strong enough. Obviously, he had a pretty poor draw with <laughs> those Savage drawers. But in the end, I mean, you can see how these days Control Warrior is able to take these wins when in the past it seemed so hopeless. Well, I think a couple of things we should talk about that game. The first is now that we have seen how it played out, should he have used those Savage drawers? Because again, it gave Warrior a lot of uh, you know, more. It gave him all the information that I don't have to be afraid of this, and then all of a sudden that wasn't really a threat later on in the game. It's possible that I mean, that he was, given the, the way the game was playing out, he, he was putting himself in the best position to win, mm -hmm. because even though, yeah, the way the game played out, he didn't quite get there, uh, it's possible that, that, you know, based on putting his opponent to this, this stage, it's like, okay, well, I have this two-turn window or whatever it is, and if, it, if his opponent didn't have Shield Maiden, Right. You know, it, 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 things just kind of lined up poorly for the, the, the specific plan that he chose to take. I will come well, the they can light. turn around. Game number three is about to begin. We have a Paladin Mirror, but it's not just any Paladin Mirror, as <laughs> Kibler was mentioning. <laughs> it is one that is going to be super aggressive against one that has all secrets. We see a little, say, we see a little bit of a, a grin from, uh, from RL there as uh, his hand is pretty much all cards he doesn't want. Well, and we saw him keep a secret in, two, or keep a secret in game one. We might keep something well, like a Venge. I believe he kept that alongside a muster for battle. He kept right. a Venge muster, which is a lot better than a Venge nothing. Well, the thing is, if you don't draw a Secret Keeper, I think it's better to just get that Venge on the board and maybe potentially get that value later rather mm -hmm. than doing nothing, obviously. 
And, and both players uh, staring the, uh, playing chicken with their mulligan, it looks like, <laughs> waiting for the other player to reveal information. And uh, this is a matchup uh, where th that divine favor is certainly not very good. Both players are emptying their hands, typically at around the same rate. Uh, it's going to be a little, uh, a little better for the uh, the ag more aggressive paladin player with more one drops, but it's still probably not a card you want to keep in your opening hand. Right, and for Bunny Hopper, the other cards in his hand, that Owl could be really good, but also it's a very situational card. You might not be able to use it early, and the abuse is kind of semi-situational. At the worst, you get a lot of damage to face. So. If you saw your opponent toss away three cards, would you consider keeping Divine Favor at all? Because you know he has a very awkward hand. This is some of the mind games that, and some of the information that people read at the high mm -hmm. levels. I, I think that I, I don't think I would. Uh, I mean, it, you're still there's still a reasonable chance your opponent just draws into a normal hand mm -hmm. and is able to curve out uh, effectively. And you're, mm -hmm. it's it's still more important that you curve out than that maybe you get some value with a Divine Favor in the middle of the game. Right. And you're suspecting that it's going to be Secret Paladin, so you're probably going to be in a situation where you know you're not going to get too much value at the same time you're also going second so you already have two more cards than your opponent to begin with all right well if rol uh was able to see bunny hopper's previous games he knows what deck's coming up here and he, and he understands what he needs to do well roll has been playing for a long time the loser's bracket it's possible that he hasn't been able to see that information quite yet and for Bunny Hopper here, I mean, looking at these two hands are actually pretty potent Let on both see. sides. For Bunny Hopper, has obviously all these two drops. Let's see what he goes with. And on the other hand, Rawl has that Muster for Battle, which is exactly what you want on turn three. So Bunny Hopper definitely having a tough decision here. Let's look what he, let's see what he goes for. Could he go for a two into a one here? Obviously, it's really annoying to get rid of that Haunted Creeper, but looks, yep. like, looks like he's going for more just annoyingness on his own side. Yeah, I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan of building the creeper here you increase the power onto your opponent's board and you're coming up on a turn where they can muster for battle and have complete dominance over your tokens so i personally like setting up haunted creeper because it also prefaces the knife juggler like you're mentioning so i think it really gives a lot of good opportunities it looks like uh bunny hopper is going with the abusive however and it looks like he is attacking the creeper oh no he's no, just face. Goes face all right yeah why kill a creeper when you can get three damage to face um, <laughs> in any case, we are going to see this muster for battle come up. I imagine it's just going to be a kill onto the uh, abusive sergeant as well as just picking up the shield. Yeah, there we go. And Bunny Hopper has the opportunity to play the Snipe Juggler, but can't really kill anything off, unfortunately. Ooh, there's a muster for Bunny Hopper as well. It's pretty big. Like, because now. He Bunny Hopper has a slightly better board with just one extra health, which is a really big deal when you have these 1-1 one, one tokens and the one attack weapon. So all of a sudden, just look at the board state. Oh, well, he's in a pretty good spot. He needed Consecration in order to do it. And that's one of the worst draws in the deck for the, men for the reasons Kib already mentioned. Uh, Divine Favor here doesn't actually do much with a, with a deck that dumps their hand very aggressively. Wow, very risky play here by Roll. Splitting up his Haunted Creeper if he saw the match earlier, he knows that there's two consecrates or consecrations. Excuse and me, there's one of them. Yeah, Whoa. found it. Found the consecration. Right on and top. Look oh, at we see a shake of the yeah. head. Roll. He knows. He is, no, 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 oh, no, no. no. Oh. Don't do it. Don't do it to me. Uh, roll the eyes in a sigh there as the entire board gets wiped out. And uh, Bunny Hopper just keeps pushing face. That stings. I mean, he's got other stuff to do. And he's got both the challengers. I mean, Rawl does have a strong follow-up here, and, and one thing to keep in mind is that when an aggressive deck does choose to use one of their early turns to play something like Consecration, it means they're not developing their board. Mm -hmm. So the, the onus is actually kind of on Bunny Hopper to actually putting pressure in this game because our, you know, Rawl does have challengers and more powerful late game in his deck. Absolutely. And we see the kill on this front half, the Sludge mm -hmm. Belcher, a lot of pressure onto the board. Can't quite get the back half, though. Yeah. Yeah, I think Bunny Hopper played a little quickly because he had an opportunity to try to get another juggle to optimize his hits onto the taunt. Mm -hmm. Because when you kill a Sludge Belcher at the same time as the juggle comes out, the slime doesn't come out in between the juggles like a Flame Waker thing. Mm -hmm. right. It ends up having to overkill and, and, and hitting the face. So Bunny Hopper had a chance, but I guess in the thing you can say, like, ah, I missed face, it wouldn't have done anything. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, he would have taken extra damage there, so it's kind of like a reflex move, sure. right? It, you, you want to just 
you know, pick on the second half there. Yep. And for Rawl, I imagine just going to be the Mysterious Challenger. He's probably just thinking about what he wants to kill here. If he kills the Knife Juggler, he doesn't have a second minion for, you know, the events to go off on. But at the same time, that Knife Juggler is super dangerous. There's the Christmas tree, though. Raw kind with of. the It's like a Challenger. Mozart, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> a Mozart? Yeah, it's kind of like the wigs looking from the side. Oh, yeah, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, kind of like the olden days. I think Uther would definitely make... Uh, uh, he, he, that's definitely his time period. <laughs> Taking a look at the uh, the hand of how it's developing, I'm, I'm looking at mm. if Bunny Hopper should even bother attacking. But it's one of those things where if you're not attacking, are you going to actually gain any how are, Yeah, how are you getting any? How, how are you killing if you're not attacking, right? So, yeah, going to be he this coming up. And what does the event land on? Pretty important here. Yeah, if it lands on the taunt minion, then it's going to get hard to get through. And so if the juggle lands on the 1-1 one, one or 2-1, or it kind of really makes it easier for his board to stay alive. And there it is. One more juggle. Excellent shredder positioning between his minions. <laughs> Absolutely. And all this damage going to face for a roll. And roll's going to have to play cleanup with a 9-8. That does not feel good. A 10-9, excuse me. Yeah, I mean, this, this turn went very well for Bunny Hopper here. And uh, Rawl here, he needs something powerful and defensive, and that's not what he has. He has just a, uh, a a big attacker, but that can't really defend him particularly well. Yeah, this is the biggest problem with cards like when you're facing against a Shredder and you're in a desperate situation. Trading into it is not efficient at all. In fact, the power might stay the same, and you actually just lose your attack, so... Uh, Roll instead is just going to try to fill up the board with as many smaller threats as possible. Even though he could have played in Mysterious Challenger number two, he feels like he really needs to just have more things that can attack because the Mysterious Challenger does not have Wind Fury. He also wants that Noble Sacrifice to be on the board because otherwise, I mean, with the second Mysterious Challenger, that wouldn't have been pulled. So Ooh, that Cog Hammer is very nearly lethal. He's actually... So close. Oh, he's actually one damage off just pushing damage to face here with that Cog Hammer. Do you just go for it? It's, I mean, it's a tough spot. You're you're facing down quite a bit of damage. I, I'm actually curious, because if your opponent has Tyrion next turn, yes. that's what you're most scared yes. of. You know, uh, ROL is going into eight mana next turn, so Tyrion is is the worst possible scenario. Uh, Coghammer potentially gives you some ability to actually attack into Tyrion, and the Lotheb uh, shuts out basically everything else. So I, I like this play from Bunny Hopper here, and yeah, ROL has nothing. That, that uh, Mysterious Challenger can come down, but both uh, sacrifices are gone, and he has no way to stop the Cog Hammer. I don't think there's a way out of this. He, he, th th no, yes, there's that. <laughs> well, there's also, I'm trying to think of like an unstable goal, and if that yeah. can actually be a, a way that RL gets out of here. I mean, he's going to try his, his mm -hmm. darn hardest. And it's, no, it's Lance not. Carrier, <laughs> why do you keep coming back? <laughs> it's because no one will play him, so oh, he's just no. trying to get some camera time. <laughs> Come once, on. Yeah, one seeker comes up. It's not Noble Sacrifice. Bunny Hopper knows it. Roll knows it too. And that's going to be 2 1 for Bunny Hopper here. After losing earlier, he's almost there to the round of eight. And I do think that this aggressive Paladin deck has been uh, a pretty ser serious story of this tournament. We saw uh, Bunny Hopper's practice partner, Diggin, uh, qualify uh, through the, 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 the upper bracket. And now Bunny Hopper is just one game away. And that Paladin deck has been a, a, a serious source of his success. Absolutely, and I think it's another strong testament to the fact that these guys practice together, and if they can qualify together, it's one of those things where people always talk about Hearthstone's a one v one game. Why do you need someone? Why do you need a team? Why do you need people to practice with? You just got yourself and ladder, but there's a lot of value into that, helping Certainly. you prepare and helping you train, so that way you understand how your lineup works. If both these guys make it, that's yet another story of you know a battery that's being formed here that's very strong and potent. Yeah, definitely. And uh, I, I think that, that, you know, a lot of people are talking about the Secret Paladin as this, this powerful and, and, and in some ways, you know, oppressive deck. But the uh, the aggressive Paladin deck, as we saw just there, you know, it clearly seems to have a, a very strong matchup in, the, in that, particular, uh, that particular matchup. Yeah, it could be just those extra options that it gets, you know, because sometimes you can get a bit clunky. Sometimes the Mysterious Challenger itself can get a bit clunky if you have it earlier on. And you saw that with all those options available to him, a Lucky Floor even didn't get that Divine Favor. But, I mean, other than that, all the minions that he had all the options in his head was able to pull out the game. Well, we are into what could be the final game of these uh, Europe preliminaries with Bunny Hopper on Druid against ROL on his uh, Secret Paladin deck once again. Good start for Bunny Hopper. He has Wild Growth and Innervate, giving him multiple options on how he wants to spend his early turns. ROL can punish that if he has an aggressive curve 
to make sure that no matter what Druid does, it doesn't matter if you're playing minions, if I can pick up really good trades and have dominant board position. It can be a big risk to keep two, for, uh, two sources of ramp when you're going first, because you might run out of options, especially when you have uh, you know, less cards in your hand. So he might just keep one of these ramp pieces, and it'll be interesting to see which one he goes for, it, if he wants the sustain of that Wild Gorth, or he wants the early tempo of that Innervate. It's a tough decision, definitely. Uh, those are certainly cards that, that he'd love to have, uh, but just not with a Force of Nature. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's probably like, tough oh, I, that I, one. Could, I could ramp into turn three Force of Nature. <laughs> You're at 24. Go. Wow, he kept both, and he caught the Ancient Ooh, of the Lord. That's pretty nice there. That's Huge. actually, that's that's the best card you could, oh, well, there's more ramp. More but, ramp. More, the more ramp, the better, right? The Ancient of Lore is actually probably you know, the best thing you can, if you have a handful of ramp, it's like, well, this draws you into actual more more threats here. Absolutely. So, uh, but. But still, that doesn't necessarily allow him to interact very quickly. The uh, He's using pretty much all of his early turns ramping up here, and that Ancient still doesn't come down uh, until at least turn five, or, or I guess turn four if Aspirant survives as well. Right. A lot of people give Aspirant, you know, a, a lot of hate these days in Druid decks, like, ah, no one's really playing Aspirants. But one of the decks that it's been excellent against is Paladin. It's true. Primarily because Paladin can't do anything to, to a Darnassus Aspirant without an absurd start, like Secret Keepers with two secrets, you know, that, that, that kind of way you can kill it. But outside of it, what are you normally going to do? Paladin struggles to deal with one damage immediately to something on the board. Exactly. Argent Lance, maybe. I actually Argent played Lance. Argent Lance very briefly in a, in a, in a deck. For, for Darnassus Aspirant? Uh, it was well. It wasn't specifically for oh Darnassus Aspirant, Lance. but uh, then I had it in a Reno deck because <laughs> I had to find cards to put them right, in Right, right, right. <laughs> well, we see the monster for battle. That is one damage. Unfortunately, already used the coin, so can't go with that. Well, and going to be up to roll to kind of get a lot of tempo, a lot of damage potentially going here before. But Bunny <laughs> doesn't really have a way to... Oh, well, he didn't. He didn't have a way to use that ramp just yet. That's really big. But this is this is an interesting spot, though, because Bunny Hopper still has a wild growth he kept in his hand as well. And if he does play the, the Shredder this turn, the Aspirin is certainly going to die. And right. that will leave him back with four mana the next turn. So he'll be using that turn for ramp as well. Maybe. We'll see. He could I also mean, use the Innervate potentially, uh, to potentially play, say, the Azure Drake that turn. But it doesn't allow him to use all of his ramp cards effectively. Right, you know, this is something good that calls back to D2 because you don't know if that wild growth will ever be played. Mm -hmm. And you kept it opening hand and it's like turn five, turn six, or, or you know, six, seven mana. And you're like, well, maybe I should just save this. And then why did I, why did I keep this card? It what is this doing? Yeah. It, it always does feel pretty bad when you, you keep a card in your opening hand and just never play it throughout the course yeah, of the game. Definitely. Oh, no, one. All right, so Bunny Hopper kind of in an situ interesting situation here. He could go for the trade on Smitty, but I, I, think, I, think, I think he's debating if he's going to innervate wild growth. Huh. Because that uh, Innervate Wild Growth allows him to, even if the Aspirant dies, cast Azure Drake next turn. Right. And I, I like this play, actually. A and, uh, yeah, this is this is a pretty heads-up play from Bunny Hopper here. He, he, he recognized that if he did not, if he did save that Innervate and not use the Wild Growth, he would basically just be skipping a turn or wasting that Wild Growth, sort of, uh, you know, not having opportunity to play it. But here, I you know, he, he does keep that ramp up despite the Aspirant dying. Yeah, one of the few times where Innervate Wild Growth is actually decent here. Other times you say, why don't you just use the Innervate instead to do what you wanted to do? But yeah, it will allow him to kind of ramp a bit better. Although, did he get a bit punished because he could have Innervated into the Azure Drake plus the Living Roots, potentially? Yes, he could have, and kept the Wild Growth. That's one of the things that you have to also be mindful of. How did you build your deck? Do you have two Living Roots and an Aspirant? Do you have one of each? Do you have two Living Roots, two well, Aspirants, and no... There's no. another Innervate if he wants it right now. I think it's well, still stronger next turn because you get to hit the Ancient of Lore guaranteed. Right, doing mm -hmm. nothing next turn feels pretty bad if you blink. But he's oh. going to go for it. Uh, Looks going maybe, for the temple right maybe, now. Uh, he's debating, certainly. I mean, the <laughs> he definitely ha may be having flashbacks to that Seeker Keeper uh, earlier in the day <laughs> that, that just ran him over. Yeah, the Stranglethorn Tiger Seeker yeah. Keeper that uh, pretty, hit him pretty Ooh. hard. But no, Bunny Hopper does not pull the trigger there. And uh, Rawl, that Blessing of Kings has got to look pretty attractive, I imagine. Yeah. I mean, turn that into a Bottle Fist Ogre, kill off that Azure Drake. And kill off the Shredder as well. Let's pretend I played four secrets. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's four mana, so it makes it sense. Is. And Doomsayer? This is, oh, well, that's, not, that's not that's, bad. That's great. really good. That's really oh, good. Oh, wow. Well, one thing to also note is that, uh, you know, it, it doesn't really matter now, but 
Uh, ROL was also given information that Bunny Hopper has things like Innervate in the hand. Mm -hmm. Picks up the force of nature, so now does it, does it there shoot is. The, oh, it does! Oh, it, wow. shoots, it shoots the Seeker Keeper, so Living Roots can yeah. actually take it down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think he was going to autopilot into going for the 1-1s one there, and then throw the Knife Juggler into the Seeker Keeper afterward, mm -hmm. but this creates a bit of a different situation. Yeah, there's still both options here available to him. He could just kill the Seeker Keeper, guaranteed, which I think is probably the, the best option because... Oh, oh no, 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 Greed mode activated oh, here. Oh, it's face for one of them. And double uh, face. All right. Well, Harson doesn't does, like the greed. <laughs> he does. He does. He has some, the, getting the knife juggler worked out well for him. The juggler didn't really do his bidding that turn, but right. Well, still in a pretty good spot. Has a pretty big board here. Even though we see the muster for battle come out and these double secrets. I mean, roll is running out of options. And at this point, if you're running out of options, you want to be putting a lot of pressure on the druid and just a little bit of pressure here. Yeah, you know, you're always worried about Swipe, too, just completely destroying you. Ooh, Dr. Boom, well, that is a nice right one. on time. You know, if you play the Emperor Thors, you also reduce every card in your hand, but I think Dr. Boom's too hard to pass up here. The the problem is that playing Emperor, you're you're planning ahead for, you know, many future turns, whereas Dr. Boom has this huge impact right away, and, and right. you know, this is a powerful board from Rawl if you don't have uh, a lot to deal with it immediately, but... Wow. That's a powerful draw as well. Keeper of Uldaman can pretty much nullify Dr. Boom. Yeah, not to mention that this was the turn six mm -hmm. from the Paladin, so you want to have the most preemptively strong board as possible. Yeah, absolutely. Completely reasonable play from Bunny. Now, Rawl picks up the Keeper of Uldaman, which gives I him yeah, effectively able to clear everything except the Boom Bot. Maybe yeah. there's something more that I'm not seeing, though. The problem here is that Roll's just trying to create parity. He's trying to get back to even. That's not what you want to do against the Druid. If you give them this much time and you give them this much kind of leeway, it can prove pretty poor. Yeah, the, the strength of Druid lies in the I fact that, that it can leverage advantages so strongly because it does constantly threaten the combination of Force of Nature Savage or late in the game. So if they're even to ch able to chip in a little bit of damage, keep one minion alive, you might just die. Absolutely. The the bright side for both players, though, is that they're still keeping pretty high in health. And it looks like we're just going to see uh, Silver Henry Truth come out, then kill the bomb. I think he, does, he wants to uh, ensure the bomb doesn't uh, blow up his keeper. Yeah, he loses he loses that. His, his life totals also. Ooh, and that swipe would have been pretty timely. <laughs> yeah, that would have been nasty if he was able to have that when there's a board of 1-1s. One but Emperor Thorst is still pretty good. A and the swipe getting reduced also helps increase Bunny's burst potential from no board. Right, you can combo and yeah, then play he, swipe on the same turn. Yeah, that'll be reduced to uh, a total of, uh, of, well, 10 mana between all three of those. All right, so what can Roll do to get back into this game? Probably Dr. Boom into Tyrion, I would think. Yeah, Otherwise, it's looking needs pretty difficult. Right now, he can't even clear clear Emperor. Well, there's Tyrion. We found one so piece. So he's, <laughs> he's going to be struggling a little bit this turn. And uh, he can't kill the Thors, yeah, which is also a really big threat. It is, for sure. Just because one of the things that Druid struggles the most with is being able to utilize its mana to effectively develop the board and clear. So if you, yeah, or, or even pressure. And if you, the longer Thors stays on board, the more options are given to the disposal. And here again, uh, Arwell looks to protect his more valuable minions against the Boombots by making them first. Though it seems a little unhappy that it ha happened to uh, happen to get hit there. Druid of the Claw is pretty nice here. Obviously, it's not something like an Ancient of Lore or an Azure Drake, which would be probably a bit nicer, but at least you're drawing something that can help you well, out, help get the board. Druid of the Claw actually represents even more possible burst damage from hand. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Probably going to see Taunt form, I would imagine, here, just to make it that much harder to kill, and that much harder to kill the Thorson as well. Yeah, I'm surprised that maybe Bunny Hopper used oh, yeah. Swipe so yeah, liberally nice. right there, uh, but I suppose he just wanted to protect his board as much as possible against things like maybe Consecration. Uh, but in this case, now you just have Tyrion, and is that enough to go through? Yeah, this is this is definitely now a game that, that ROL is in much better shape. Tyrion is clearly no joke, and uh, Bunny Hopper doesn't have the, the, the tools to actually get it off the board very easily here. But he has five mana combo. That's he, pretty he does. good. <laughs> Arwell's still at 22 life, though, and he has Lotheb in hand. So mm. it, you know, it's, it's possible that, that this Tyrion and the Lotheb to follow it up on a turn where he might be in threat of, uh, of dying to combo could help him turn the corner. Well, if you're a bunny hopper here, this is one of the biggest minions you're going to face for the remainder of the game. So do you just go ahead and use combo here to clear everything off, 
sustain your board, and now you have a pretty big board against a Secret Paladin, which doesn't really do well against a board that's already established, unless they have, oh, I mean, un unless it's the early game, obviously. Yeah, I, I think that might be your best option at this point. Yeah, you, you can't get through Tyrion without it, pretty much. Well, yeah, you can he, get through he, Tyrion he gets, you He could throw all of it, every single thing at it, including his hero power. You can get through Tyrion if you just use Force of Nature. You don't need yeah, to necessarily true. even use Savage Lord. It's one of the things where you still have one of these cards up your sleeves. Mm -hmm. uh, because you still might pick up a, another charger of some sort. All right, well, Tyrion stays up. Three mana combo. Three <laughs> mana combo. All right, well, Keeper Voldemort's pretty good here. I, I mean, other than something like Dr. Boom, he's able to use all of his mana. So roll not out of it quite yet. And he does have the Lotheb as well. So he can shut down the combo possibility from Bunny next turn. Is there any way to take out this Thoros? And I don't believe so. Mm. I don't. I don't see it. Right. No. So, I mean, actually, turning this Drew of the Claw into a three-three doesn't really help you too much. You're still taking three damage instead of four on your on your Tyrion. So, this Keeper Volume actually doesn't really do much. It's true. It, it can reduce the amount of damage that that Emperor potentially mm. does right. attacking in. Uh, but yeah, both. Uh, no matter what, something is going to be able to kill Tyrion. Uh, that, that Bunny Hopper has left remaining. I think, sadly enough, you still have to get the 3 4 on the board, though. I believe so. I, I, I don't think that, that RL really has time. That, you know, he knows that Bunny Hopper has a, has a hand that's basically free mm. at this point, right. thanks to Emperor. One thing to consider, though, is if you, if you give the, uh, excuse me, the Tyrion an odd amount of health, that could help out with combo pieces. Well, Tyrion's going to die this turn, you have to imagine. Oh, that's very true, yeah. And you're locking your opponent out of combo thanks to the Lotheb. Uh, that's a Lotheb for Bunny as well. Which is nothing really more than just a 5-5. Five -five. I mean, pretty a five much... 5-5 is relevant, though. It, it's five extremely five relevant. It's extremely relevant because it's the biggest stats that you'll have in your deck outside of Boom. Mm -hmm. Druids don't really run any 6-6 six -six or 7-7s. Seven well, they, they don't run Dr. Boom, but what outside of that, mm -hmm. not really anything. So it's probably the, one of the best cards you could have drawn. And I imagine we'll probably see Emperor uh, attack into Tyrion here. Maybe not. Maybe maybe he actually doesn't want to give Bunny Hopper the uh, the weapon right away. Though obviously Ariel Rol can attack with the Tyrion on his turn to, to get the weapon immediately. So I, I suspect we'll see the Shade remain concealed because it represents an additional threat that can get buffed by the combo, and Rol does not have the tools to remove from the board. Yep. And you hear a power face that gives you. 21 damage guaranteed next turn. Right. And 21 this is damage, putting yeah. RL to 21 life. There it is. So, uh, 21 for sure. Yeah, so roll, <laughs> he well oh, consecrate a bit too late. That is a little bit too late. And that that's going to wrap it up yeah, I then. Don't, I, don't, I don't see any way out of this for RL. If we're, assuming we're doing our math right, that is six damage <laughs> from that. With 21. Yeah, no, that's. With five that mana. That is 21 for yeah, sure. <laughs> with five mana, including the hero power, he can do 21 damage. <laughs> it's, uh, it's pretty nice. Mm. But ROL definitely deep in thought, trying to find any way out of this. I, if, I imagine he'll just be like, well, I can't beat combo. And uh, right. try and clear as much as he can off the board and push face. But uh, this looks like Bunny Hopper is going to be our final representative uh, at the Europe Championship next month. And what a cool story once again, because mm. he's practiced with Diggin and both these guys who have helped each other, not necessarily with any large organization either. Be able to go to the Winter Finals, that's, that's such a cool story. Yeah, I, I think that the, the structure of the Hearthstone Championship Tour, the, the ways for people to qualify throughout the season, uh, definitely allows for players, you know, who might not necessarily be able to come out to major events, you know, who, who play online cups, who have excellent ladder finishes, give them an opportunity to, to reach the stage. And uh, Bunny Hopper is making the most of his chance here. And here it is, 21 for sure. Roll with the saddest and you silver see, hand recruit the, you've ever seen. Fate. Look at Bunny, Bunny knows, he's, he, he's just <laughs> he's immediately it. Yes. He's and counted that probably 30 times while Rawl was taking his turn. <laughs> Rawl like, taking. What? Is this it? Yep, yep, <laughs> yep. Definitely. Rawl taking off his headset already knows it's over unless there's some sort of crazy misclick here. Even then, he'd probably be in a good spot with Bunny Hopper being. And that's going to do it. You guys have gone over it a thousand times already. Bunny Hopper is moving on to the Europe Winter Championship. What a ride for him. Twice on stream, second time's a charm, guys. Yeah, and you see that huge smile and sigh of relief on his face in the cam there. You know, obviously, this means a lot to him. Oh, certainly. I have to imagine that for most of these guys, this is some of their first tournaments they ever play in. And to come really deep far and, and after practicing for a long time and, and having an opportunity to shine, because some of these guys have practiced 
a lot on ladder. They they have never had opportunities to climb through the open. This is what it's about. This mm -hmm. is kind of what the championship tour is and what it's meaning for. I think a lot of people are still disappointed ultimately because they don't see some of their favorite players. But who knows? Maybe in the coming months we're talking about these players nonstop because they're the ones who are dethroning the people at the top. Yeah, maybe they get, make some new favorite players. You yeah. know, we've, we've seen some excellent play from these players. Some cool decks out of a lot of. Uh, we saw Egg Paladin, you know, <laughs> on the, the the match prior that I came on stream today. That's so right, we did a lot of cool stuff and. You know, Tar is one of the qualifiers with the Curse of Rafam in his in his Warlock Zoo deck. So lots of uh, excellent play, lots of cool decks, and uh, I'm excited to see these players face off next month. I'm just wanting to really, I'm super excited to see who's going to be the Europe champion for winter. I mean, that person's going to go to BlizzCon, going to make a pretty nice paycheck for himself. And I mean, like you guys said, he could make a big name for himself and become one of those players. Yeah, it's $100,000 on the line. Uh, for the Winter Championships. So it's also one of the biggest events you'll see all year. Uh, you know, and, and you're playing Hearthstone. And it could be you guys as well. It's just anybody that wants to sign up for the events, you know, for spring season. If you want to, start laddering now because this month in February, the points also count for the following season it rolls over. So make sure you guys are also trying your best. If you really want to compete in it, it the next person could be you on stream here. Cast it by Kibler in D2. Because <laughs> I'm going to be too old to, to cast by then. I'm going to retire in the next month or so. Dude, I'm oh, so I'm, much I'm passing the torch. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly don't feel that way with our schedule recently. But uh, we've been having a lot of fun. Thank you so much for everybody who's uh, joining us as well. Um, and I know a lot of people have also been featuring the tweets. One of the m cool things, too, is about how engaged the entire thing is. Uh, and thank you so much for spending your Valentine's Day with us. Uh, you know, Kibler also recently got married. And he's also Ooh. spending Ooh. Valentine's Day with us. That's commitment. I'm going, I'm going home to my wife right after this. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. I she's, swear, I swear. Yeah, yeah. But and then, you know, you have to say hi to her and Shiro, the dog, as well. So that's kind of the hard part. But Shiro's not your wife? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it, it might feel like that. It certainly might feel like that. They're also running a cool thing on Twitter, too, at the Play Hearthstone uh, Twitter page. If you tweet at them, hashtag kiss the frog, you might get a little special picture and a little caption underneath. It's just a little small promotion to, to remind you guys that you are probably like me and very lonely today. Hearthstone <laughs> loves you. Oh. <laughs> Feels real bad, man. <laughs> All right, I think we're waiting with Aquabot for an interview to talk about, uh, you know, some of the series, what he thought about it, as well as get to know our winner a little bit more. Thank you very much, Frodan. Great game. Bunny Hopper going from winner's bracket into the lower bracket and securing his spot in the top eight. Uh, we'll have him with very shortly. But overall, this event has been fantastic. We've seen a lot of players get knocked down and knocked out. But we've also seen some uh, fresh faces come out on top. And they will be re representatives at the Europe Winters Championship in a couple of weeks. So we're going over to Bunny Hopper now. Are you there? Yes. Uh, How's it going, man? How do you feel right now? You've just qualified for the well, the first big tournament of this year. You must be feeling great. Yeah, I'm feeling great. It's awesome. Yeah. So you uh, tell me a little bit about your strategy going into this tournament and some of the preparation you did to get this far. So uh, I was um, preparing a lot with another player, Bunny Hop, and uh, board control. Um, I think he dropped a bit earlier, but I basically took some decks that I've been playing on ladder really successfully, and then I took all the decks that I liked on ladder, cut out all of those which are like bad against the decks which are like played a lot in tournaments, and then I basically arrived at this lineup. Um, you said ball control, right? Because he's a UK player, so he's one of like my boys. I've met him uh, before as well, so it's nice to see you practice him with someone I know. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm practicing with him all the time, and I'm basically talking before, like, even the small tournaments and everything, just talking through lineups, improving plays, stuff like that, all the time. So has the uh, victory here at the preliminaries inspired you to kind of pursue Hearthstone more as a professional career, or are you just going to, like, just keep playing for fun? You know, what's your ambitions going forward? Um, I mean, I, I, have a, I have a job, which is my main thing, and... Uh, that is going to stay my 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 focus, and uh, Hearthstone will be on the side. And as more as I can achieve, the the happier I will be. I will be but uh, we'll have to see. Well, you get to go back to your job and say, "Hey guys, I'm off to Cali to play in a massive event with loads of prize money." That's really a a big deal. So, is there any shout outs you have for anyone at home, people who have been supporting you through your journey here in this tournament? Yeah, I, I, I want to shout out Boar Control once again, and then also Diggin, 
that I've discussed with uh, a lot during the days. Um, yeah, that's it. Don't have and Tegan's so one of the qualifiers as well, which is awesome. Yeah, that will be great. Well, it is Valentine's Day. Is there anyone special in your life you'd like to give a big shout outs to? Not right now. Ah, I'm sure you'll find love, man. You know, you've just uh, had a big victory. You can tell all the girls, you know, I'm a Hearthstone champion. Anyway, thank you very much, Bunny Hopper. I look forward to seeing you in the upcoming weeks at the Winters Championship. Thank you. All right, then, guys, that's it for this event. We've had an amazing event, loads of uh, different things and stories going on. You know, just a big shout out to the team and the casters here providing amazing coverage for you guys. And of course, if you want to get in touch with us about the event, you know, please sure to let us know. And this is actually the top eight in front of us. As you can see, uh, a lot of new faces coming up through the championship tour. And we're going to be very excited to see what they're capable of going into that top eight. So once again, thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, if you'd like to tell us uh, what you think about the event, some of the players, be sure to check us out on Facebook and Twitter, at Play Hearthstone on Twitter, and of course, Hearthstone on Facebook. So that's it for us. Uh, thank you again for tuning in. And be sure to tune in next week where we have the America's uh, Winter's Preliminaries as well. So until then, guys, we'll be signing off. Uh, take care and uh, see you around.